decibel. It needs to be one to one, which you could either uh, say that if you know an output, then it has to come from exactly one input, or you can do a horizontal line uh, test on the graph. So we're about to look at trig functions. Every trig function is not one to one. They're very not one to one. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure we chop up the domain, restrict it down to something very small, so it's one to one. And we'll do sine first. And we'll do a super fast graph. So there's a really fast graph. That's a period and a half of sine, but that's more than we're even going to use. So this obviously fails the horizontal line test. So what we're going to do is start erasing parts of the graph so that it is one to one. So <clears throat> you always want to include the point zero, zero, the origin. So we're definitely going to start there. Let's go to the right first. How far can I go to the right before I'm not one to one anymore? That's right. So pi over 2, top of the hill. Once you start going downhill, you're not 1 to 1 anymore. So what I'm going to do is erase a bunch of this over here. Not going to use this part of the function. So we're stopping right at pi over 2. Now, how far can I go to the left before I run into a non 1 to 1 part of the graph? So I can go exactly to the bottom of the hill, which is minus pi over 2. So we're going to restrict the domain. Two minus pi over 2, positive pi over 2. The range is still the original range. We didn't chop anything out of the range. We still get negative 1 to positive 1. So there's our restricted domain and range. And now inverse functions. You can think about functions as a way to go from the domain to the range. So if our function went this direction, our inverse function turns the arrow backwards. So it'll be uh, written as f. It looks like to the negative first power. But we know by now that's not the reciprocal function generally. That's the opposite or the inverse function. And over here, usually we would call this a range of f. That's the exact same thing. If you asked f inverse, hey, what's all this stuff over here? It would tell you, oh, it's the domain of f inverse. So the range of f is the same as the domain of the inverse. And likewise, over here, this would be the domain of f. That's the same thing as the range of f inverse. So <clears throat> when we write uh, the inverse sine function, the new domain, so for sine inverse, our new domain is the original range. So our domain is the original range, which is minus 1 to 1. And inverse sine range is minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And remember how we invert functions. So if we have the equation of y equals sine inverse x, that's the same as moving the function to the other side. That's the same as sine y equals x. So that's how we invert functions. We move them to their side as their inverse. And we have to be a little bit careful. If I see y equals sine inverse x, uh, if I flip that around, I have to also say that y is in the, right here, the restricted domain of sine. So y can't be anything. y has to be inside the restricted domain, which is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. The problem is you would normally, if I didn't write this down, 
if we didn't have this, I would have an infinite number of y's that would satisfy this property. They'd all be separated by 2 pi, basically. And I can do the exact same things to cosine. I just get a different restriction. So I'm not going to go through all the uh, trig functions. We're just going to go to the, we'll just write down the, this property. So for cosine, if you have y equals cos inverse of x, that's the same as cos y equals x, except we have to restrict where y comes from. And a super fast graph of cosine looks like this. So what we do to cosine is we go zero. We restrict the domain to be between zero and pi. So that's how we force cos to be one to one. So the domain of cos x is going to be just, and we'll clean this up. So we're throwing out all the stuff over here. So our domain of cos is zero to pi. So that's the cosine inverse, and then we'll do one more for tangent. So algebraically, it's easy to write the inverse function down, just move to their side. And now we have to be careful about the domain of tangent. So I'm going to draw one period of the tangent graph. So tangent has a nice uh, graph such that one period is exactly one to one for the tangent graph. The only difference is we cannot include pi over two and negative pi over two because those are vertical asymptotes. So domain of tangent, the restricted domain of tan is negative pi over two to pi over two, but it's open on both sides. So there's the three <coughs> algebraic inverse properties that we're going to be using. So we'll do two example problems before we jump into some more geometrical properties. So these will be just, uh, just like the same type of problems you had in pre-calculus class. So find sine inverse of negative square root 3 over 2. And one thing, another thing to keep in mind, normally your trig functions, any of the six trig functions go from angles to sides, the ratios of sides, and that means your inverse trig functions going the other way. So any of your inverse trig functions are going to eat sides and give you angles. So it makes sense for sine inverse to be eating things that look like sides right there. So I want to know what angle has this uh, sine value. So one way to do this is you let, I know I'm looking for an angle, so I'm going to let theta equal sine inverse negative square root 3 over 2, and then flip it around. So I'm going to move the function to the other side. And now I also have to be sure that theta is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So tell me which theta has this sine value. And I'll give you 30 seconds to jog your memory. You can draw a unit circle out. That might help out. If you don't remember any of your trig values, it might be a good thing to put on your cheat sheet. Uh, I don't think it'll be a multiple of pi over 4 because those are all 1 over square root 2. 
or minus 1 over square root 2. So I need a negative y value. So, and it's not quite negative 1, but it's the last stop before negative 1 at the bottom. So there would normally be two points on the unit circle that had this y coordinate, but I only want the one on the right because I want to go negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So you should get negative pi over 3 as that angle. If I was going for the other all answers and I wasn't restricted on my domain, then I would also get the, uh, what would that be, negative 2 pi over 3 or positive 4 pi over 3, whichever of the names you want to use. So theta negative pi over 3. So any questions on getting this? So our next example is probably one of the trickier questions from pre-calculus class. So I will tell you what this is not. This is not 5 pi over 3. How do I know this cannot be pi, 5 pi over 3? Let's think about cosine inverse. Cosine inverse only outputs between 0 and pi. So there's no way this can be bigger than pi. So 5 pi over 3 is way too big. So the way we solve this in pre-calculus class. So in order for cosine inverse to cancel the cosine, so we'll write that, that property up. And they do cancel when theta is between 0 and pi. Then we get to cancel these guys out. So what we're trying to do is figure out what theta has the same cosine value as pi pi over 3, but is also between 0 and pi. So I want to find theta, find theta in 0 to pi with cos theta equals cos 5.